going to get radical. We want God to be proud of us. Luke 18, there's a very funny story about a very prideful man. Beginning in verse 9, he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves and were confident that they were righteous, that they were upright and right standing with God, and scorned and made nothing of all of the rest of men. So here's the story he told them. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. You know, Pharisees are the, they do the right thing outwardly, but their hearts are rotten. Jesus called them whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. <laughs> One was a Pharisee and the other just a tax collector. And tax collectors had a really bad, bad, bad reputation. Nobody liked the tax collectors. So you can imagine how a religious man talked about a tax collector. The Pharisee took his stand ostentatiously and began to pray, and I love this, and began to pray thus, before, and with himself. In other words, he wasn't even talking to God. I'll bet you that he was trying to sound so eloquent so he could just be so proud of how holy he sounded. Have you ever caught yourself praying in a group out loud, and you're no more talking to God than a man in the moon, if you're honest? Come on now. Let's get honest. You're trying to impress everybody else. I've done it. Still do it sometimes. Because <laughs> we're just really all about wanting to impress everybody. But really, we need to learn how to live before one, God. How to live before that all-seeing eye. And to be God-pleasers, not men-pleasers. The Pharisee took his stand ostentatiously, began to try to impress himself with his prayer. Oh, God. <laughs> God, holy God, <laughs> I thank you that I'm not like the rest of these people. <laughs> now, you know what? We might not have the guts to say it, but we think it sometimes. <laughs> I would never do that. You don't know what you do put in the right situation at the right time. We better say, well, God, I hope I would never do that. Strengthen me, God, that I would never do that. I think that I'm not like the rest of men, extortioners, robbers, swindlers, unrighteous in heart and life, adulterous, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. <laughs> I'm sure he didn't just fast, he fasted. <laughs> I give tithes of all that I gain. But now this tax collector, <laughs> merely standing at a distance, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he kept striking his breast saying, Oh God, be gracious and merciful to me, a wicked sinner. <laughs> I tell you, this man went down to his home justified and in right standing with God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. We have to deal with the pride issue. I would encourage you at least once a year to read a book or a lengthy article on pride. And I'm serious, because that is one sin that we can have, and our pride will not let us know that we have it. That's why we have to know the symptoms of pride. Pride causes judgment. It causes a critical attitude. It causes us to have a sense of entitlement. Well, we deserve that. Why didn't you do that for me? Why did you do that for them and not for me? It causes us to think that we're better than other people. Actually, I even read this in a book that I'm reading right now, and I thought this was kind of an interesting statement. We seem, he said, to even get a perverse enjoyment out of talking about how awful society around us is. <laughs> Let us be sure when we do that that we are not just in moral pride. 
I thought, yeah, you know, there could be a little something to that. I mean, because we talk, I cannot believe the world is the way it is today. Well, things are in a mess. There's no doubt about it, but we better make sure we're not in a mess. You know? Another area where pride can get us, especially in the church, is pride of correct doctrine. Every denomination thinks their doctrine is the right one. You know who's right? None of us. You say, I believe that. I think we're all doing the best we can, but I bet we are going to find some stuff out when we get to heaven that is going to go like, I cannot believe that I didn't see that. Come on. I mean, we fight over some of the dumbest stuff. How many arguments, how many doctrinal arguments have there been over how to baptize and when to baptize? You know, if you're concerned, baptize your babies, go again when you get grown, get sprinkled, get dunked, get it all, but don't argue about it. <laughs> you know, I've been doing some study of the book of Ephesians, a little deeper study in the book of Ephesians, and it talks about the mystery of God's will and brings out the point that the whole purpose and the plan of God is to unify all things in Christ, to bring down everything that divides us, to cut down every dividing line. No more Jew nor Greek, no more male nor female, no more slave nor free. We're all one in Christ. How about no more Baptist, no more Methodist, no more Catholic, no more Lutheran, no more Pentecostal. We're all one in Christ. We're the army of God until we stop all this pride over our own doctrine and just begin to fellowship around the things that we agree about. Well, today I'm teaching on the truth about obedience. You know, there are many misconceptions about it, but I want to focus on specific concerns that you have sent to me about this issue. And we're going to return to the conference teaching, but first, Ginger's here with me with some questions that you've sent in. Well, you were talking just a few minutes ago about some of the issues that we all have that keep us from obedience being our own pride yeah. and some of the questions that come up in our lives because of lack of humility. And there are some really good questions along those lines. This is from Lisa from Omaha. And she says, while I know I'm human and I try not to condemn myself, every day seems to go by and I don't seem to be able to maintain the love and peace like I have on some other days. <laughs> I believe, frankly, that it's selfishness and pride taking over again and not submitting to the Lord. So what can I do to maintain that obedience to be able to realign myself, get back on track? You know, I think that uh, one of the things that, that I've discovered since I've been walking with God now close to 35 years, or at least attempting to, is our whole walk with God really is a journey you know, there's a lot of questions that people have that only experience can answer. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that helps us obey quicker and more fully is by having the results of disobedience. Mm, yeah. Like someone just told me, well, actually it was my daughter. Uh, she said, I had gotten away from uh, spending that first time in the morning with God, which she knows God has really dealt with her about that because she would have a tendency to be more independent, want to do it herself. And uh, so God's really worked with her over the years about, you know, show that humility to come to me first, ask me to help you with everything, give me that time. And she said, I, she said, at first I started like, well, you know, I'll just listen to a teaching while I'm taking the kids to school. And she said, not that it has to be a law, you know, and that, and that there would never be a day when I could do that, but she knows that God has dealt with her very firmly mm -hmm about giving him that first bit of time in the morning. And I'm not laying down a law for our viewers, you know. I, I do recommend giving God the first part of your morning, but I know that, you know, maybe you're not a morning person, you do better at night or whatever. So the, the main thing is, is you need to give time to God. So I'm not giving you a new law, but for her that's best, for me that's best. And she, she knew what God had told her to do. Mm -hmm. And so because she wasn't doing it, she started just feeling unhappy. And she's the kind of person that can't stand to feel unhappy. She's never depressed. She's got a real up, bouncy personality. 
And she said, after about a week went by, I thought, why am I so unhappy? What is wrong with me? And then she said it was just like, ah, ah. the lights came on. Yeah. The lights came on and she texted me and she said, well, I got busted for not <laughs> spending my regular time with God. So, and really even that's an area of obedience, mm -hmm. you know, and I had to go through that. I cannot tell you how many times I had to go through God teaching me to spend that time with him, doing it for a while, then letting other things get in the way and not doing it, having a bad experience, rather that, you know, for me, I tell people I've got to spend my time with God in the morning just so I can be nice. You know, I think, you know, basically we're not going to walk in love and, and show the fruit of the Spirit if we're not regularly letting God know mm -hmm. that, that we need Him. So in answer to the young lady's question, I really believe that a lot of times we, you can read the Bible and we, somebody can tell you, you can listen to a teaching tape, but you got to get some experience too. And I think when you just go around the mountain enough times, then you finally figure out, you know what, I just really just need to do what God's telling me to do because there's no way it's going to work otherwise. Yeah, now that's reassuring because it gets easier. And I mean, we are on a we, journey. Yeah. You know, God doesn't expect us to know everything the first minute that he tells us. And so mm -hmm. he's patient. And as long as we continue to press in and press on, We'll get there. Yeah. Well, here's another one for you. This is from Louie from New York. Louie says, I've been struggling with obedience most of my life. I take one step forward and ten steps back. I'm always asking myself, how did Jesus do it? <laughs> I'm listening um, to you now teaching about humility and gentleness. And I work as a peace officer in a jail. And to have a gentle and humble heart is not easy. <laughs> I'm struggling with obedience in my mind, my tongue, and my actions every day. So what advice would you have for Louie? Well, I think that Louie needs to get to know God a whole lot better. I, you know, I've been studying recently, and I mentioned this on another program, about how when we're dealing with sin and something that we feel like we can't overcome, that we don't really need to try harder to be good what we need to do is get to know God better. And not only to know the love, the grace, and the mercy side of God, mm -hmm. but to also know the, the more serious side of God, that, you know, God means what he says. Right. And the Bible says plainly, if you do this, you'll be blessed, and if you don't, you won't. So we don't, That's interesting. you know, we just don't have the right reverential fear and awe of God, and not fear like in a bad way, mm -hmm. but but reverential fear, and, and even like in our whole society today. I mean, I was watching a movie last night where the little boy in it was like, um, uh, he'd had a lot of hard knocks growing up, and, and his dad had had nothing to do with him, and his mom had raised him, and then she had died, and he'd been, you know, continued to be raised by other friends. But in the process of all that, he, he understood respect and, and reverence and Somebody, he wanted to do something, and one of the gentlemen that was helping take care of him said, no, you can't do it. And he said, oh, please let me go. And he said, no. And the little boy just said, yes, sir. And he just went on to bed like he was told. And I was thinking, my goodness, it would be nice if people were like that today. I think in our whole society today, there's a lot more of this, I'm going to do what I want to do, and I don't care who likes it attitude. And the thing is, is our society may change, but God doesn't change, mm -hmm. and he still very much means what he says. And I, it's just a real balance in teaching people to not be afraid of God in a wrong way, right. but to also know that God does mean what he says. Yeah, I, I love that, especially for this particular circumstance, because yeah. when you say that, that he needs to get to know God better, it, it's not in a condemning way. It's, no. it's in that really understanding what he has for us, what he wants for us, and how serious he is in that. Because as an officer working in a jail, he has to understand those rules, those guidelines, and there are consequences right. if you break those. And even as an officer working in a jail, to be humble and gentle doesn't mean that you become mousy right. and you let people walk all over you. Obviously, he needs to be strong with these men, but you can be strong without being mean. Right. You know, Same and, for any parent at home, yeah, right? Right. And it's just, obedience is a beautiful thing. And I mean, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. Now, he did not say, if you obey me, I'll love you. Hmm. Because yeah. God's already that's, decided that's what great. he's doing and who he is. And, and he's already made a covenant with us that is not based on us. God is still the same, no matter what I do. But 
if I break the conditions of that covenant, even though God doesn't change, I don't receive the benefit yeah. of that covenant. So here again, for Louis or whoever has Louis's problem, I think that we just need to realize that you are cheating yourself. When God asks you to do something, to say, I've been disobedient most of my life, well, you know, then you've missed out on most of God's blessings in your life and you either haven't been taught what obedience really is or you have no reverential fear and awe of God. You know, I very much believe in teaching the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, but it has to also be balanced out with the importance Definitely. of obeying God promptly and doing what He tells you to do. Yeah. And, you know, if we just think about, you know, one good lightning storm, you know, that's a little piece of God, you know, <laughs> you know? and so I, 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 want God, I want God on my side, you know, and we know that God would never do anything to hurt us, but if that's the only way that he can get us to not hurt ourselves, then it's like, it's like a parent, you know, who tells their child, don't go out in the street, right. play in traffic. Right. Well, it would just be great if the child would just say, Yes, mommy, and go do it. And you don't, you don't want to have to punish them, but if you give them your word, you tell them what to do, and they don't do it, out of love, you will touch their circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, loving discipline. Because you don't want them to get hurt. Right. And so that's the thing. When, whatever God's asking people to do, it's for, it's for their good. Mm -hmm. you know, just, it's for your good, whatever God is asking you to do. It's for your good. You say, but it's hard. Well, you know what? God would not ask you to do it if he wasn't going to give you the grace to do it. So just stop saying it's hard and thinking how bad it hurts and just imagine how wonderful it's going to be to have that full peace in your heart that you're doing what God wants you to do. There's nothing that feels better than to lay your head down on a pillow at night and know that you gave it your best. And even at that, we fail every day. But the good news is, is God doesn't punish us because we haven't arrived what he wants us to do is keep pressing on. Now we're going to go back to the conclusion of today's teaching in the conference. Now, here's the thing that I would like to say. Because I think God just spoke this to me about a situation that I've been dealing with. I think the more we know and we still choose to do what we know is wrong, I think we open the door wider for the enemy. And we get ourselves in much deeper, more serious trouble than those who are ignorant. And I'm not saying, I mean, listen, God's mercy is so deep and wide, we don't even begin to understand it. But I tell you what, we, we gotta quit pushing the envelope just to see how much of it we can get. And now, here's what I want to say to you. You being here tonight and hearing this message gives you a greater responsibility than you had when you walked in those doors. I get it. It's like, well, maybe I won't come back tomorrow. <laughs> Coward. Come on, everything God tells us is for our good. I didn't just go in a drawer and pick out this sermon because I wanted to stand here and tell people straighten up and fly right. I would have been just as happy to preach to you about miracles of the love of God because everybody likes that. I mean, I'm going to stand before God and give an accounting of why I preached. I got to preach for what God tells me to, not what you'd like to hear. Amen. And maybe right now tonight, God's using my mouth to keep somebody out of serious trouble. I don't know. Don't think you can play with fire and not get burned. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. It creeps me out to think of all the dumb stuff that people are doing, thinking they're going to get by with it, when little do they know that their whole life is about to fall apart. Well, what about mercy? What about grace? What about forgiveness? What about love? It's all there. 
but are you educated beyond your level of obedience? How many Bible studies is it going to take <laughs> before we say, got it? The Bible says in James 1 that if you are a hearer and not a doer, that you are deceiving your own self through reasoning that is contrary to the truth. So let us in our few closing minutes say a word about excuses. Because it is amazing how we can know and agree with what the Word says and would tell anybody else who didn't, do it how, who, who didn't do it how wrong they were, but we find an excuse why it's okay for us not to. Well, I know I should tithe, but. Well, I know I shouldn't say this, but. <laughs> well, I know I shouldn't stay mad, but. Come on, is anybody home out there tonight? I remember one time in my childish dumbness telling God, Dave and I had had an argument and I could tell the Holy Spirit was trying to get me to go and apologize to Dave. And I was like, I was not gonna do it <laughs> because I didn't think I was wrong. And this is what I said to God. Well, that's not fair. I apologized to him the last time, it's his turn. And then I felt like the Holy Spirit said, show me where that scripture's at. Be a peacemaker if it's your turn. Amen? Excuses. Well, I'm not going to tell him I'm sorry again. I told him sorry last week. It's his turn. We have to get rid of all the reasoning. <laughs> Amen? Get rid of all the excuses and all the reasoning and get radical. And say, you know what? I'm just going to do it. Yes, there's mercy when we make mistakes. And yes, there's grace. And there's forgiveness. And God loves us. And I don't think he, we ever run out of chances, but I want to live for God's glory. And I want to put a smile on his face. And I don't want him to have to spend six months trying to talk me into obeying him for every little tiny thing. I want to be quick to hear, quick to obey, quick to do what God wants me to do. There's too much to be done in the earth today, and He needs us fully equipped and ready and capable to let Him use us. Amen? Every time you walk in your church, you come out with a greater responsibility. Every time you read a Christian book, you come out with a greater responsibility. And I think if we begin to think about it like that, maybe it would help us. Maybe if you go out and buy my new book on Never Give Up, you better look at that cover and say, well, I guess when I get rid, if I'm going to read this, then I better get ready to get rid of my wimpy, whiny, self-pitying, poor me attitude. But see, what we like is we like to buy them and put them in our library. Oh, we're so proud of our libraries, aren't we? I moved a couple of years ago and I gave away hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books. And you know what? When I walk in my library now, I don't feel as spiritual as I used to. It's funny about us. The more books we have, the more spiritual we feel. Are you with me tonight? Every time we hear the truth, there's a responsibility. <laughs> 